There's an episode of Courage the Cowardly Dog I remember from when I was young. To the people who are unaware, the cartoon revolves around a dog and his elderly couple owners who live in the middle of nowhere and the supernatural occurrences that always seem to happen to them. The episode that stuck with me was called The Great Fusili. In the episode, the three main characters participate in a play hosted by the Great Fusili. But as it turns out, it was a ploy for Fusili to turn the main characters into wooden puppets to store in his caravan. In the end, Courage defeats Fusili and makes it out safely. But his owners, Eustace and Muriel, aren't so lucky. They are transformed into wooden puppets, and Courage uses their wooden bodies to mimic the life he had before. The part that sticks with me most is that this was the season 1 finale. If Courage was never picked up for another season, this is how the show would have ended, with the characters stuck as living puppets for the rest of time. However, this isn't where the show ended. Courage was picked up for three more seasons, Courage would go on to meet Scooby-Doo, and Scooby-Doo would go on to meet John Cena. This episode isn't even the scariest moment of the show. That award goes to this horrid abomination that was the actual series finale. But the reason this episode has stuck with me for so long is because it's a nostalgic sort of horror. Because Courage was the type of show I'd watch when I was young, and the scarier elements of the show stayed with me long after the show stopped airing. And this strong sense of nostalgic horror has become a big part of indie horror content on the internet. Some great, and some very, very bad. Hey, if you're watching this, I bet you have a problem. You have too much money! It gets everywhere, it clogs the drains, clutters up all the space in your home. What you need is something cool to spend that money on. Which is why this video is sponsored by Manco Store. Manco Store is a marketplace for items from all your favorite games. TF2, CSGO, soon to be CS2, Rust and more. The great thing is you can just buy what you want for prices way cheaper than the Steam market. And all of the items you buy are also instantly tradable, so you could theoretically buy like 500 Pomsons and dump them on all of your friends to prank them. And you can pay for those Pomsons in any way you want. PayPal, card, crypto. However, I'm pretty sure they don't take payment by carrier pigeon. So, sorry to all of you folks who pay by carrier pigeon. Baba, who cares about that when they're giving away a burning flames team captain? That thing is worth at least like $12. And for the real money enjoyers in the audience, not only can you buy some sick ass items, you can sell your dumpy items you don't want for actual real world money that you can either cash out or spend on some fine art or use to get even better items instead. So come on down, hop on down to Banco store and buy some cool ass items. Uh, buy some items for for your girlfriend, your, your boyfriend, your kids, your kids' kids. Santa's got something special in his sack this year because he's making sure to give all the naughty kids a strange bison for Christmas that he bought using my link in the description for some awesome bonuses. Make sure to use the link in the description and show Manco Store some gratitude for sponsoring this video. And without any further ado, let's dive back into the video. One of the earliest and greatest examples of this horror through nostalgia is from a creepypasta written by Chris Straub called Candle Cove. This story is presented through various forum users who gather together to reminisce about an old children's TV puppet show called Candle Cove. It starts out innocently enough, having a humorous conversation about how low budget and awful looking the show was. A character named Pirate Percy who was just a bunch of other dolls and puppets stitched together. But as the group keeps talking, Things aren't like how they initially remember. A skeleton puppet called the Skin Taker who wore a suit made of skin from children he's kidnapped. An episode of the show entirely composed of clips of all the characters screaming in horror with no sense of plot or direction. And the most shocking revelation of all. I visited my mom today at the nursing home. I asked her about when I was little in the early 70s, when I was 8 or 9, and if she remembered a kid's show called Candle Cove. She said she was surprised I could remember that and I asked why, and she said, because I used to think it was so strange that you said, I'm gonna go watch Candle Cove now, Mom. And then you would tune the TV to static and just watch Dead Air for 30 minutes. You had a big imagination with your little pirate show. This story really exemplifies the feeling of visiting something from your past, but something is just wrong and it's not how you remember it. This nostalgic horror of TV would be expanded on in years to follow with the rise of analog horror, using past memories of news broadcasts and VHS tapes to present terrifying concepts of body and cosmic horror. Granted, nowadays it's as easy as using a VHS filter and some warp tools in Photoshop. See? Now it's scary. But there's one example of this nostalgic horror that resonates with me specifically, and that's the concept of liminal spaces. 
The concept of liminality is defined as occupying a position at, or on both sides of, a boundary or threshold. To simplify it, imagine two rooms with a connecting hallway in the middle. The two rooms are different stages, and that hallway in the middle that connects them is the liminal space, a place between boundaries. A photo of these places can provoke a strong nostalgic reaction out of you. Photos of liminal spaces blew up in 2019 when this photo was uploaded to 4chan. The dingy hallways and fluorescent lights really clicked with me the first time I saw it. That feeling that this place is somewhere I've been before. But it's nothing more than me imprinting a mishmash collage of past memories onto a photo of some dingy yellow hallways. There's so many more of these photos that elicit a strong nostalgic reaction from me. Idyllic scenery that looks artificial, otherworldly locations I swear I've seen in my dreams, these photos grab your attention by using imagery from your youth, the stage between infancy and adulthood. And while you may not have the same reaction as I do to these specific images, I guarantee if you look online, you'll find something in these liminal spaces that you can relate to. But if you look at these images long enough, you'll see a connecting thread among them all. Hallways with dim fluorescent lighting, the inside of a familiar looking house. None of these places have any people in them. In these spaces, you are completely alone, just you and your thoughts. There's almost a kind of serene feeling to liminal spaces, but this could easily be flipped on its head. Look at enough of these photos of empty locations, and you could start to get the feeling that you're not alone. In this otherworldly, dreamlike location devoid of humanity, there's something that could be waiting for you around the next corner. It's for this reason that I think liminal spaces are the apex of the internet's obsession with nostalgic horror. With these spaces, it's not the corruption of your nostalgia which is used to scare you, you're scaring yourself by imprinting your own nostalgia onto these photos. But this concept of liminality isn't only applicable to physical spaces. In 2004, Valve released Half-Life 2, and with it came the brand new Source game engine. In the years since Half-Life 2's release, a lot of other games have been made using this Source engine with a lot of them becoming instant classics as well. Team Fortress 2, Portal 2, two Counter-Strike games, Left 4 Dead 2, Dota 2, Postal 3. The tidal wave of innovation in the gaming scene that has come from this game engine still ripples across the gaming landscape today. However, these days, the Source engine is really starting to show its age. When it was first released, the Source engine was revolutionary, but today, many of the games created on its engine are dated relics from a bygone era of gaming where Overwatch 2 didn't exist. Even Valve is undertaking the process of moving their most iconic games onto the new Source 2 engine. This has led to the Source engine gaining a nostalgic aura, and over time, an entire fan base has developed for the Source engine. Source just has a certain mystique around it that you'd be hard pressed to find in other game engines. For all the good games created on it, you don't really see people fanboy over the Unreal Engine in the same way they do Source. And this nostalgic feeling that the Source engine gives people, those late nights playing Counter-Strike, TF2, and Left 4 Dead with friends, it opens it up to a familiar phenomenon. The Source Engine is liminal. Booting up an empty map in a Source Engine game and just wandering around gives me the same feeling that a photo of a liminal space does. There's an uneasy feeling to be in these places where giant 24 people battles are fought and just being alone. And this liminal feeling that these empty maps gives you, it can give you that same type of liminal horror. That feeling that around the next corner you turn, the next door you open, there could be something there waiting for you. For example, in Gmod, in the default map GM Construct, there's this large, pitch black room under the map. And while the room itself is designed for testing out lighting tools, if you spend enough time in there, you can begin to feel unsettled. You might find yourself checking over your shoulder in the dark, you know, just in case. A purely irrational fear. It's impossible for something to be hiding in this dark void. But sometimes, you just can't help but think. What if there really was something there? waiting for you. This concoction of nostalgia, gaming, and horror has led to one of the strangest internet phenomenons to blow up in recent times. The Gmod ARG. 
There are multiple web series on the internet that use Gary's Mod of all things as the setting for a horror web series. These videos exploit the unease of the Source engine and nostalgia for old Gmod machinimas as a basis to tell their narrative. Dark figures waiting in corridors, unexplored parts of maps you thought you knew, and diving even deeper into that terrifying dark room from earlier. And while many of these have sprung up over time, there's one web series I'd like to focus on for the purpose of this video. Gunslinger Pro 2009. The channel only has 8 videos, but I won't be covering them all for the sake of brevity. But if you find what I talk about interesting, check them out. I'll have a link in the description. The first video on the channel is called Sniper is Book, and it's a faithful recreation of the type of thing you'd see during the Age of Gmod Machinimas. Sniper is Book! Read me. However, just like the other examples of nostalgic horror, something just isn't right. The next video is called Spy is Sandwich, a direct follow-up to the previous video. It follows the same format, however the video takes a very strange turn at the end. Sandwich. How could this happen? The spy character seems to be alive and sentient, panicking while banging on the camera for help. The player character comes up from behind them and drags them away. And the next and final video I'll cover is called Gary's Mod Walker Tutorial. The video is a tutorial on how to create a machine in Gmod that allows ragdoll characters to run. In the beginning of the video, the soldier is used as an example of the mechanism, and later, the player creates a new machine and attaches the same spy from the previous video to it. However, when the spy is attached to the machine, he behaves a lot differently. Once more, the spy is seen trying to escape. Not only that, he seems to be able to move completely on his own. Earlier, as the player pulls out the remover tool to delete the soldier from existence, look at the soldier's reaction. He's shaking his head as if he's begging for his life. And let's listen to the voice lines he says at the beginning of the video. In this web series, the characters are sentient and conscious of what happens around them, and the player character in the videos is knowingly torturing these ragdolls to make these videos. Just like the Courage the Cowardly Dog episode from my childhood, the characters of this web series are living puppets with no control. And that finally brings me to today's topic. What am I, six pages into this script and I'm just now getting to the point? Sorry. Anyways, today's topic is the culmination of everything I've talked about up until this point, and I believe it serves as a great prelude to the web series I'll be talking about today. Because this video is about a web series called Interloper, created by a YouTuber named Anamide. It's a web series that I feel captures that liminal feeling of the Source engine and nostalgia to create a truly creative and captivating narrative. However, I highly recommend watching the web series for yourself before continuing the video. The series isn't gonna have the same punch with me analyzing every last second, just like with Emesis Blue. But to everyone who just came back, or is still here, let's dive into Interloper, the terrifying source ARG. The first installment of Interloper was uploaded in October of last year. The video follows Anamide as they investigate a mystery in Half-Life 2 called The Interloper Mystery. The first trace of The Interloper goes all the way back to 2005, where users on a forum discuss a strange graffiti in Ravenholm, infamous for being one of the most spooky and macabre chapters of the game. Anyone see that weird graffiti in Ravenholm? It's in the beginning part of the dark alley part. Very creepy if you ask me. Is this a glitch or what? And when you walk up to it, there's a weird noise. Is this a G-Man? In the alley in the intro? What alley? The dark one or the one with a light in it? 
I checked both and I didn't see anything. Anomi begins an in-game search for the graffiti on November 11th. Just as it said in the forum, in a dark alleyway near the start of this stage, you can see a graffiti of a man holding an umbrella. He has a blacked out face with white facial features. There's a couple things off with this graffiti, however. The graffiti itself is a modified version of another Umbrella Man decal in the base game. However, this Umbrella Man in Ravenholm is tastelessly wearing blackface. For shame. However, the strangest difference is when you look at the file in the Hammer Editor. The Hammer Editor is what is used to create maps for the Source Engine, and at multiple points throughout the series, it will be used as a tool to uncover secrets behind the interloper. When opening up the Ravenholm map with the graffiti in the Hammer Editor, you can access the Umbrella Man decal. In Hammer, you can apply images to wall brushes to add detail, and this Umbrella Man is one of the decals used in the map. By lifting up the graffiti's decal texture, you can see that the Umbrella Man has no legs, and under him is a corrupted jumble of pixels. By opening up the graffiti's file in a text editor, you can see a message. For JJ, Council, Interlope. Unknown Command, Interlope. Council, Get S Interlope, Pull, 27015. There's some interesting things to note here. This message was cleverly hidden inside the game using a corrupted decal file, and it's addressed to someone named JJ. It appears this JJ person had an inside man at Valve sneak him this message from right under their noses. Whatever this message means, it's something the higher-ups didn't want to get out. The second thing to note is that the message is telling JJ to use a set of council commands. The developer council is a tool you can use that allows you to access certain commands that affect the game. For example, you can type noclip into the council to gain the ability to fly through walls and everything on the map. You can use council commands to load up a certain map, make yourself invincible, or do whatever the hell this is. The sky is the limit. The command in the message is called interlope. The definition for the word interlope is become involved in a place or situation where one is not wanted or considered not to belong. Even the name for the command itself directly states it's something for us to not know about. Did you see that? Congratulations and welcome. Please enter with caution. You are not welcome here. By accessing these commands, we've become the interloper. But what happens when inputting the commands is even stranger? For a brief moment, the player character loads into a map, flails about, before being kicked back to the main menu after only a few seconds. What we just saw was a demo recording. So what is a demo recording? Well, there's certain council commands that let you record your gameplay footage and replay it in-engine. Simply type record to start, and stop to finish. Recording a demo will send a demo file you can use on your computer. However, what's particularly strange about what we've just seen is that Onomi did not record this demo, nor did they have a demo file to run this on their computer. This demo was completely generated using the interlope council command. After the demo plays, the file for it is saved onto their PC. Anoma uses the interlope command to generate more of these demos, and it looks like most of them are just like the first. One or two seconds of random flailing before being booted back to the main menu. This first type of demo occurs approximately 90% of the time. However, there are some very interesting outliers. In some demos, the character spawns out of bounds in the skybox, looking inwards towards the map, completely motionless, before dying. Other demos feature the character aimlessly wandering around for minutes on end before abruptly ending. An interesting quirk of the interlope command is that it's not only able to generate demos, but even randomly generate entire maps. In this example from the video, the map is nothing more than a mishmash of props and shapes, like if a toddler tried to create a half-life map. But the fact that the interlope command can even generate a map from scratch at all is extremely interesting and will come back into play later. From here, Anomi discovers that the interlope commands work on more than just Half-Life. They also work for the other Source games. Counter-Strike Source and TF2 also work with the command. And if the interlope commands work with these two games, it also means that it also likely works with Valve's entire catalog. This includes Half-Life 2 in all of its episodes, Half-Life Deathmatch, TF2, Counter-Strike Source and Counter-Strike Go, but not for long, Dota 2, both Left 4 Dead games, the Portal games, Day of Defeat, and a couple of the smaller ones I missed. The interlope command having this much of an effect on so many different games means it's part of the Source Engine as a whole. We don't know what purpose this command serves, 
but it must be very significant to have an effect on so many games and be purposefully hidden by Valve. And what happens in one of the demos for Counter-Strike Source shows why that might be. What you've just seen is referred to as a Type 5 demo. I'll explain why they're called that later. Compared to the other demos produced by the Interlope Command, these ones are extremely unique. They are characterized by their VR-like movement and creepy imagery. Earlier, I talked about the liminality and uneasiness of the Source engine, and these Type 5 demos are that concept fully realized. That irrational fear that something might be around the corner isn't so irrational anymore. In the demo, you can hear a faint twinkle sound. This sound effect signifies the presence of the mysterious Umbrella Man, who appears just as they do in the Ravenholm graffiti. In the demo, the Leet crew is dragged through the walls by the Umbrella Man and is hung suspended out of bounds. He drops his gun and it falls, but some force is keeping the character suspended in the air. If you look closely, as the Leet crew struggles, you can see the Umbrella Man watching from a distance. We don't know the significance of the Umbrella Man, or what exactly is happening in this demo, but what we do know is that Type 5 demos are the rarest of all the types of demos the Interlope Command can produce. In the forum thread from the beginning of the video, we learn that there are two other famous examples of Type 5 demos, both from the Half-Life series. One is nicknamed Spooky Coast, and the other is nicknamed Misty. However, clips of these Type 5 demos have become lost media. Looking at the screenshot from Misty, we can see what appears to be the camera pointing towards a map from Out of Bounds, similar to the Counter-Strike Type 5 and the other various demos Anomi recorded. It looks like the skyboxes are very closely interconnected with whatever is happening with the Interlope Command. Despite their extreme rarity, Anomi was actually lucky enough to capture a second Type 5 demo, this one taking place inside TF2. The funny thing about this Type 5 is that internet humor has come so far that if you remove the context for this clip, it just looks like a TF2 shit post. But besides that, if you were paying attention to the audio in the clip, you can make out a similar twinkle sound effect similar to that heard in the Counter-Strike Type 5. But after hours of creating demos and uncovering two Type 5 demos, something strange happens to the Interlope Command. They stop working. No demos are generated, and the Developer Council stops recognizing the Interloper commands. Going to the same spot the Umbrella Man graffiti was before in Ravenholm, it's disappeared without a trace, erasing itself from the game. With no new leads to uncover, Episode 1 ends. 
if it wasn't for a last minute discovery by Anomi. Remember the two lost Type 5 demos, Misty and Spooky Coast? Although both were believed to be lost, Anomi recovered a recording of Spooky Coast from the Half-Life 2 forum. And thus, we get to see a third Type 5 demo. In this demo, someone approaches a building, and peering through the window, you can see corrupted civilian models. Their animations are janky, and they stumble around aimlessly. That is, until one of the civilians detects the character, at which point, we hear that same twinkle sound cue. Their eyes glow bright white, just like the Umbrella Man, and they lunge towards the camera, and we see that the civilian's face has been completely blacked out, like a band It's Always Sunny episode. It's here where I'd also like to note an important detail. Look at the hands of the character in the video. That's not the hands of the HEV suit. The character we're watching isn't Gordon Freeman, who you play as in the game. It's a random civilian. We also catch a glimpse of them right at the end of the clip. As they are pushed into the water, you can make out five umbrella men looming over them as they drown in the water. We can hear them gasping for air, but in the final frames of the video, you can see that they've fallen out of bounds into the skybox just as the terrorist was dragged there in the Counter-Strike Type 5. It seems that the Umbrella Man's purpose is to take these characters in these Type 5 demos and drag them outside of the map. But why? Episode 2 begins on November 9th at 12.05 a.m. The events of the previous episode happened on November 11th of the previous year, which means that a year has passed since the events of the first episode. Anomi has returned to Ravenholm and sees that the Umbrella Man is back in the alleyway. But with the return of the Umbrella Man means that the Interlope Council commands are active once more. For some reason, the Interlope Command is only accessible for one day in November each year. Which means Anomi only has six hours to find out as much as they can about the Interloper. So this episode has a ticking time clock element. And with the Interlope Council command able to generate demos again, let's go over the five most common types of demos that can be produced. Type 1 is the most common, occurring roughly 80% of the time. These are the demos where your character does their best impression of an epileptic person at a rave for 1-2 to two seconds before abruptly ending. The second type of demo is the Stuck in the Sky demo, where your character is out of bounds and stares inwards towards the map before dying. These occur roughly 10-12% to 12 of the time. The third demo is the Aimless Play demo, where your character becomes a games journalist and aimlessly wanders around the map doing nothing. Anomi suggests a popular rumor where the gameplay in these demos is actually gameplay from another map transplanted onto a different map. Keep this in mind for later. The fourth type of demo is the Proper Play demo, where the character graduates from a games journalist to a video game let's player and actually properly plays the map as intended. A fascinating detail about Type 4s is that they are fairly uncommon in other Source games, but they are exceedingly common in Portal specifically. And the fifth type of demos are simultaneously the most interesting, but most rare. Type 5 demos feature VR-like motion and appearances from the Umbrella Man and other bizarre entities. So far in this series, we've seen three Type 5 demos, nicknamed Sea Strike, Fortress, and Spooky Coast.
Remember how after recording a demo, that demo was saved onto your computer? Well luckily, Anomi saved the files from the Counter-Strike and TF2 Type 5 demos, and has a link to download them in the description of this video, which means you can replay these demos for yourself in your own game. In the first episode, Anomi also discovers that the Interlope command has the ability to generate maps. And the maps in these Type 5 demos aren't exactly the same as their base game counterparts, something I'll touch on later. After the first episode in the series was uploaded, Anomi states that viewers reach out to him about the VR-like movement in these Type 5 demos, stating that it could be VR tech that is producing the demos. However, Anomi shuts that down because VR only captures the movement of your head and hands. However, in these Type 5 demos, the characters have full control of their entire body, and the characters in the demos are also able to fully interact with their environment. Another suggestion Anomi received is that a cut source tool called the DM tool is responsible for the Type 5 demos. However, Anomi shuts this down as well, stating that they couldn't find any evidence of this tool existing, and labels it as a hoax. However, keep this image in mind, as there's a lot more to this DM tool than one might think. Anomi tests more games to see if they're compatible with interloper commands. Day of Defeat is fully functional, CSGO is unstable, but it works, and strangely enough, Dota works as well, as long as it's on a build of the game before Dota was ported to Source 2. What makes Dota 2 so fascinating is that like unlike every other game built on the Source engine, Dota 2 is not a first-person shooter. The camera hangs from the top down, which makes demos generated by Dota 2 much more unique. Gary's mod, the sandbox mod of Half-Life, isn't fully functional in its current build. However, there are other versions of Gmod that use a more stripped-back version of Half-Life as a base. So Gmod version 9 is fully functional with interloper commands. So far, this gives us 7 games to play with with the interloper command. But as time runs out to use the interlope commands, Anomi settles on Portal to finish out the investigation. Oh look, we got one. Look. Oh, what? Oh. Do you see that? I just did that. Speaking of control, look, I can crouch. Okay, WASD doesn't move. Hey, it's our guy. Hey, guy. And that looks weird. What is that? Is there anything else of note? Yeah, I know, right? I I don't think the chamber looks like this. It looks weird. Oh. <laughs> Is that the player? Interesting. Oh. name? Uh, it's like show trigger toggle. Huh? <laughs> what? Alright, I'm not gonna lie. It's not very often that one of these web series like this gives me a genuine scare. Typically, I find them more interesting and scary as a concept. But the first time I watched this video and got to that moment, it scared the shit out of me. But, but let's rewind this clip, because there's a lot to unpack here. With 15 seconds left on the clock for the interlope commands, Anomi successfully loads a Type 5 demo. However, when the timer reaches zero, 
the character makes a drowning sound, and a series of messages appear in the chat bar. The messages read, Connection lost, reattempting connection, and error 405. Error reason text. An error 405 in the programming world is when a user tries to do something that's not allowed, and Anomi loses connection to some sort of server after time runs out. The creepy thing is that Portal is a single player game. There's no servers to connect to. So what exactly was Anomi connected to prior to losing access? Whatever it is they were connected to is what allowed for the interlope commands to be used. After losing connection, Anomi gains control of the camera and spawns a hint node. In the Source engine, hint nodes are what is used to determine how NPCs act. However, what's strange about what just happened is that you place node hints in the hammer editor. However, Anomi has just placed one while in-game. This node hint exactly matches what we see in the DM editor screenshot. So even though Anomi labeled it as a hoax, there's obviously more to this tool. And watch what happens after the node hint is placed down. The character in the Type 5 demo walks towards the node before coming to a complete stop when they reach it. Anomi has just unintentionally directed the NPC using this node hint. After interacting with the NPC, Anomi begins to explore the surrounding area. You can catch a brief glimpse of the Umbrella Man watching him from a window. And after, Anomi also sees a model of Shell acting very strangely behind a glass window. Just like in Spooky Coast, the person in control of the game in these Type 5 demos isn't the normal protagonist, but instead, a civilian model. While examining Shell, you can hear the Umbrella Man's sound cue. He's making his presence known. You can catch a brief glimpse of the Umbrella Man floating past a wall, before he lunges through a wall at Anomi while he's in the pause menu, when everything in the game world should be at a complete stop. There's something really eerie about seeing something slowly approaching the camera while the game is supposed to be paused. After this, the Umbrella Man makes contact with the player and Portal crashes. So you may expect this episode to end in the same place Episode 1 did. The Umbrella Man erases all traces of the interlope commands from the game, thus leaving us at a dead end until next November. However, making direct contact with the Umbrella Man had more unexpected consequences. Watch what happens when Anomi tries to reopen Portal after his encounter with the Umbrella Man night um yeah my portal install is uh kind of fricked so yeah the player loads into a game a single room with an illuminated checkerboard floor and pitch black darkness surrounding it. After a few seconds, the game crashes back to the desktop once more. When first loading in, you also receive the message that the node graph is out of date. The node graph is what allows NPCs to move around the map. The entire game, as well as any traces of NPCs, have been removed by the Umbrella Man, leaving only an empty husk of what was once Portal. The episode ends on this note. However, we haven't explored everything that the episode has to offer. Going back in time a little bit, remember how the demo files Anomi generated are linked in the description so you can see them for yourself? Well, you can actually download them, and they actually work! Here's footage of me running the Type 5 demo in my copy of Counter-Strike Source. There are slight visual differences compared to the original demo, but it still works. The TF2 Type 5 demo only partially works, however. Trying to load the demo in the console yields no results, but there is still a way to activate it. But I'll get to that later. For now, let's dive into the maps produced by the Type 5 demos. If playing a normal source map feels eerie and liminal, then the maps generated by the interlope command are even more so. 2 Fort and Dust 2 are some of the most iconic levels in gaming, and I think it's no coincidence that these were the maps used to explore for the ARG. For the most part, the maps remain untouched, but there's some details missing, small things wrong that just give you this unsettling feeling as you explore them. Exploring the modified Dust 2, you'll quickly discover that there's no invisible walls or boundaries around the map, which means you can easily escape and go out of bounds. Going towards B site, where the Type 5 demo takes place, in upper tunnels, you can find the view model of the Leet crew in the demo. The view model is essentially a model layered over the screen that holds your weapon, like an overlay. 
At the beginning of every Type 5 demo, you can see a view model spawn right where the player starts. Looking to where the Umbrella Man spawned in the demo, you can see a red error sign. To those not familiar with the Source Engine, these red error signs are used to represent where there's data of a model, but the model itself is missing, leaving this bright red sign in its place. After capturing the Elite Crew NPC, the Umbrella Man has erased himself from the files of the game, leaving behind an error sign in his place. But things get very interesting when you go towards mid, where the second Umbrella Man spawned in the demo. Here you'll also find a second bright red error sign, and next to it, the model of the Elite Crew and Galil weapon he carries. However, by decompiling the map's files, you can access it in the Hammer Editor as well. You are able to fully explore the maps in Hammer and examine things with an even finer lens. When inspecting the error models that were the Umbrella Men, you can see that they are named Capture, followed by random characters. This lines up with what they are seen doing in the Type 5 demos, capturing the NPCs and dragging them somewhere horrible, presumably Britain. The model of the Elite Crew, which shows up in-game, is shown as an error in the Hammer Editor. Examining it shows the file name is called DMNPC Capture Pawn. What's especially important is that phrase, DMNPC. Obviously, NPC stands for non-playable character, but what about the DM? Earlier, we saw a low-quality snapshot of something called the DM Editor. And now this NPC that behaves entirely different to other NPCs has the same exact prefix? It can't be a coincidence. My theory is that the DM stands for dynamic, and the DM tool is responsible for creating these dynamic NPCs in these Type 5 demos. Going towards the view model in Upper Tunnels shows that it has the name The Husk. Considering that view models are just overlays placed onto your screen to simulate your character interacting with the world, it makes sense for it to be called The Husk, as these characters in these Type 5 demos are shown to be able to fully interact with the world with no view model necessary. Diving into the map's properties reveals a comment left by an unknown party. FSKY SVRGEN. Perhaps it stands for FSKY Server Generation. We've already seen how servers connect to the Interloper Mystery. Exploring the modified 2 fort also gives us some more insight. When loading into the map, the first thing you notice is how pitch dark the map is. You need to use the council commands to be able to see anything at all. Another huge difference is that the map lacks a proper skybox, which causes this visual distortion effect that basically turns the whole screen into what it looks like when you win a game of solitaire. You weren't able to fully explore the map either. If you try heading down to the intelligence room where the demo takes place, this happens. This is the map Rebuilding Cube Maps, 3D renders of the map used for reflections, which gives off this eerie effect. Remember how I said that the TF2 Type 5 demo isn't accessible with the council command? Well, the way you access it is through this map, and the way you achieve it is very bizarre. On the red balcony, you can find a message written on the wall, FSKY. Another mention of this mysterious abbreviation we already saw in Dust 2. Approach the FSKY symbol on the wall, and the demo activates. After the demo ends, it also activates the rebuilding cube maps. Decompiling and diving into this map in the Hammer Editor reveals just as many hidden messages. Just like the terrorist in Dust 2, the scout is also labeled as a dynamic NPC, showing another connection between the two Type 5s. Going towards the Red Balcony, you can also examine the F-Sky logo more closely. The logo prop is named FUCK, Fuck YOU, and the map comment is CHICKEN SHIT ADMINISTRATORS COME GET ME. Clearly, whoever left these messages is the least toxic TF2 player. SHUT THE FUCK UP! Next to the prop and hammer, you can also see the trigger zone that starts the demo. And inside, you can see a player start icon. These don't show up in game, as they simply just tell the engine where to start the player in the map. The name for this player start is called The Tool. From the messages left in the map files, we can deduce that someone is very unhappy with something called FSKY. However, we have no idea of what FSKY is. But, by searching FSKY on YouTube, we discover the next big piece of the puzzle. This is a video uploaded by a channel called Ida Machinima Video Archive. It's a 2005 ad for a forum called FSKY. It's a re-upload of a re-upload. I'll play the ad with changed music to avoid copyright, and we'll pick it apart after.
looks like this video is an ad for a server hosting website called FSky. The ad features these uncanny mannequin-esque characters dancing to music. The way these characters look and move is super unnerving, but I'd like to point out the similarities between the way these mannequins move and how the dynamic NPCs move in Type 5 demos. Looks like these gray characters are a primitive version of what would go on to be dynamic NPCs. If you watch real closely, you can see another similarity to the Type 5 demos. As the F-Sky logo fades into the screen, if you look at the space between the S and the K, you can see the outline of one of the mannequins stumbling forward before wildly failing about in a manner similar to the corrupted civilians in Spooky Coast. During this scene, you'll also see a checkered floor, which is becoming a motif in this series. Earlier, this same checkered floor was seen in the corrupted build of Portal at the end of Episode 2. F-Sky is using the Source Engine and these dynamic NPCs to promote what they call the future of games entertainment and sell F-Sky servers. The tagline under their logo is Norwegian and translates to Server Hosting and Technology for You. We also catch a brief glimpse of the website's domain name, which has been censored. It ends with .no, confirming that F-Sky is a Norwegian business, and begins with the letters F-S-K. For exactly one frame, you can catch the full domain name, but due to the quality of the video, it's not visible enough to fully make out. Back during Nomi's investigation of Portal, when the time to use the interlope commands runs out, in the bottom left, it says they've lost connection. Perhaps the reason the interlope commands are only accessible one day a year is because it's the only day that the F-Sky servers are online. This video is a re-upload of a re-upload from the official F-Sky website from 2005 which is right around the same time the interlope commands were first being discovered. And by looking at the channel that uploaded this video, we can learn a lot more. According to the About section, this channel is an archive of a former YouTube account called Itamona Machinima that was active from 2007 to 2014. There was an eight episode series of some sort of ghost hunting series and a series of Mona videos. The person behind the channel had some sort of mental breakdown that resulted in the deletion of the channel, and this archive is trying to re-upload as many of their old videos as they can. Looking through the channel's uploads reveals at the time of writing this, 11 videos. They all have various dates from when they were originally uploaded, so I'll cover them in the order they were chronologically uploaded in. The first video on the channel is named Gary Man Eats Tacos and Dies, uploaded in 2007. And it's a very crude animation of G-Man eating a watermelon and farting, represented by a thruster attached to his... <clears throat> anus. This video is also one of the first instances of clickbait. Believe it or not, this video doesn't have much to do with the plot, except right at the beginning, where we can see that this video was created by someone named... Jan. The second video is called Gary's Mod Zombie Slayer, also uploaded in 2007. This video is an absolute blast from the past to anyone who watched Gmod videos growing up, right down to the Breaking Benjamin song and Hypercam logo in the top right. However, there's some interesting things to note about the video. At the start, a female ragdoll rests on a couch named Mona. At one point, Mona says the phrase, I love you, sweetheart, to the player character, Ida, clearly showing some sort of romantic dynamic between the two. At the end of the video, the camera falls to the ground and cuts back to the main menu revealing the entire video we just watched was a demo. The next two videos chronologically don't have much significance, but things get really interesting when we get to Interloper Episode 3, Ghosts of City 17, uploaded in 2011. This video was uploaded over a decade before Anomi would upload their series investigating the very same interlope commands. This is the ghost hunting series referenced in the channel's about section. The video starts with glimpses of different types of demos. First, a Type 2 demo, then a Type 1 demo, and then a Type 5 demo. One which we haven't seen before. In the brief clip, a civilian walks forward, picks up a can, looks to their left, and sees the Umbrella Man, tall and looming in the corner. This video is part 3 of my investigation into the interloper ghost of Half-Life 2. If you don't understand what's going on here, watch episode 1 and 2 on my channel page. But before we hunt ghosts, I need to give a warning.
An interesting difference between Anomi and Ida is that while Anomi approaches the mystery from a purely logical viewpoint, Ida believes that the interlope phenomenon is a supernatural occurrence, referring to the Umbrella Man and dynamic NPCs as ghosts. This creates an interesting foil between the two investigators, and it causes them to approach the way they research the interloper mystery in vastly different ways to different results. While Anomi investigates the mystery with their knowledge of the Source Engine and its inner workings, Ida takes a different, more paranormal route. Using the Hammer Editor, Ida creates a Ouija board-like map, a blank room composed of an alphabet, a ragdoll, and a question written on a wall. He uses the interlope command to generate a demo on the map overnight, and checks back in the morning to see what happened. If Ida's theory that the NPCs in the demos are ghosts trying to communicate with the living is correct, then the NPC in the demo he generates should use the alphabet on the map to answer his question. He asks, What is your name? However, he doesn't receive the answer he was looking for. Instead, Ida generates a Type 3 wandering demo with the NPC aimlessly walking around and shooting the floor at random intervals. Assuming that the previous map was too complicated for the NPC, Ida instead changes the alphabet to a simple yes or no question. He asks, Can you feel pain? No luck. The same thing happens. Another question. Are you human? This demo is a little more open to interpretation. If you agree with Ida that this is a paranormal phenomenon, then you could see this demo as an actual answer to the question. However, if you view it more logically like a Nomi, then this is just another random Type 3 demo. However, it's the final question that Ida asks that yields the strangest result yet. He asks, Are you trapped? I have never seen a demo like that. He just faced through the wall. No weapons, no HUD. Everything looks weird too. But that wasn't the end of the demo. No, this thing was two hours long. Mostly just pure darkness. However, what I'm about to show you is what happened at the end of the two hour demo. Now this is a demo unlike anything we've seen before. It slots into none of the five types we've gotten used to. In the demo, the player has no weapons or HUD, and the camera simply moves forward through a wall, traveling out of bounds for two whole hours. In the void, you can hear a faint ambience, something that shouldn't be possible in the Source Engine. Eventually, the camera reaches a map that Ida did not create. By all means, this shouldn't be possible in the Source Engine, as two maps cannot be connected this far apart. Yet, there it is in the distance, two hours away from Ida's Ouija map. Rewinding towards the beginning of the video, you can see the ragdoll that Ida placed, having never done anything until this point, flailing madly. It looks like it's trying to approach the yes answer, but something is containing it. Ironically trapped in place, trying to answer the question, are you trapped? We see why the ragdoll is pinned in place. Below their feet is a node hint, something we've seen before in episode 2, capable of controlling a dynamic NPC. This ragdoll is a dynamic NPC. This video brings into question whether or not these occurrences are paranormal, and judging by the ragdoll's reaction during the final question, it's a possibility that could very well be real. There's also some things to note about how Ida has been generating these demos. Not only is Ida able to generate a demo on a specific map of his choosing, but he is also able to generate interloper demos multiple days in a row, whereas Anomi can only generate demos one day in November a year. This lends credence to the theory that the interloper commands are powered by FSky servers. With these videos taking place a decade before the main series, we can assume that the FSky servers were much more active, and thus made interlope commands much easier to access. 
Ida has also discovered more features of the commands than Nanomi has, judging by their ability to create demos on specific maps. The video ends, and unfortunately, episode 3, so far, is the only archived video of the ghost hunting series, leaving what happened before or after ambiguous. The next important video is called Weird Crash in TF2, uploaded in 2012. The description reads, We finally caught one of the crashers on camera. I also tested and confirmed my hypothesis on what these ghosts are doing. My TF2 has been unplayable due to crashes in blue screens. I'm surprised this video works. Looks like during the investigation of the interlope commands, Ida has gained some sort of attention from outside sources. Ida's already hinted at this in their interloper investigation, but now we get to see what an interaction with one of these crashers looks like on camera. In the video, Ida is playing TF2 on the map CP Steel. He looks through a window to see a T-posing Blue Scout. Already something is wrong. Not only is the Blue Scout T-posing, but they are inside the red spawn room, somewhere that should be inaccessible to the blue team. What Ida's teammate says next is equal parts creepy and intriguing. What? What are you looking at? Over where? I don't see anything. This anomaly is only showing up on Ida's screen, exclusive to his copy of the game. The crasher begins to move, with Ida following it. The crasher notices Ida, turns around, and clips through a wall. Ida frantically goes into spectate mode to see where the crasher goes. It flies through the skybox, and TF2 crashes. After the game crashes, a map is shown on screen of the direction the crasher flew. Just what was that entity, why was it there, and what hypothesis did Ida confirm with this encounter? Ida specifically calls this scout entity a crasher, a fitting name seeing as it crashes his game. As far as what the entity is, let's rewind to the first episode of Anomi's investigation all the way back to the TF2 Type 5. In it, a dynamic scout NPC is trapped in the 2 Fort Intelligence Room, where two T-posing heavies confront him. Loading the map in-game and approaching the heavies causes your game to crash. Something about the interlope command has caused these entities that can crash your game, presumably as a roadblock to stop people from investigating it. That answers what the entity is, but why does it fly through the skybox, and what hypothesis was Ida trying to prove? In their interloper investigation, Ida creates a demo where the camera passes through a wall and travels for two hours before stopping at a completely different map. Here, the crasher flies through the map in a similar manner, and Ida catalogs its movements. It's possible that all the maps in the various games are connected, and you can travel through the infinite void to end up at a different map. It's what happens in the two-hour demo, and it's what the crasher does in this video. Ida cataloged the entity's movement and traveled along the same path, and if the description of the video is accurate, Ida actually found themselves at another map. This also explains how the Umbrella Men are able to travel through different maps and games because they are not confined to a single map. They can travel through entire games because they are all connected. The Source Engine isn't just a game engine, it's essentially a whole contained universe. The next video in the timeline is the F-Sky Forum ad originally re-uploaded by Ida in 2014. However, we've already covered this video, so we'll move on to the next one that's also centered on F-Sky. A day after re-uploading the F-Sky Forum ad, Ida re-uploaded another video called Make Face Demo. The video is showing off some sort of tech demo with software replicating a 3D model of someone's face from a single sample photo. Based on the finished product, the software still has a long way to go. In the video, you can spot the same checkered floor we've seen at multiple points throughout the series, and while the model of the face is forming, it's wrapped in missing textures. Much like how the error sign is used to represent a model missing from the files, the purple and black missing texture is what's used to represent when a texture is missing from the files in the Source Engine. This means that this creepy face replicating software is being used in the Source Engine. It seems like during the course of his interloper investigation, I just stumbled upon F-Sky and took a special interest in it, re-uploading clips directly from their website onto his YouTube channel. Four months after Ida re-uploaded these F-Sky ads, he would upload his most cryptic and disturbing video yet. Earlier, we saw in the channel's about section that Ida had a mental breakdown that resulted in the deletion of his channel. Here, we see the result of that breakdown. The video is simply called, I'm done. Goodbye. The description reads, You win. I quit. Now leave me alone. This is my last video. In a few hours from now, I will delete everything on the channel. Just posting this video as proof, 
then I'm gone. Deleting my YouTube and Steam and server. Goodbye, and fuck, fuck you. you. Here is the video. In the video, we see a room consisting of a checkered floor surrounded by complete darkness. The same exact room Anomi finds himself in in the corrupted version of Portal. In the center of the room, a gray figure, much like the mannequins from the F-Sky forum ad, is twitching and missing their entire lower body. Ida refers to this figure as the Mona. Earlier in the Zombie Slayer video, Ida portrayed himself as a romantic partner to someone named Mona, and Mona is even a part of the channel's name. Whatever this thing in the center of the room is, it's very important to Ida, to the point where he uses deleting it as proof that he's giving up. He presses delete, and an error sign approaches the Mona and kills it. Mona makes the same drowning noise we've heard multiple times before as they die. Earlier, we saw that the Umbrella Men are represented by error signs, so this error sign entity that kills the Mona could very well be one of the Umbrella Men deleting a dynamic NPC that Ida created. This is the DM tool, and Ida was using it to create something he called the Mona. We already know that Ida believes that the dynamic NPCs are ghosts trapped in the Source Engine, and we also know that he was close with someone named Mona. My theory is that Ida Mona Machinima was a joint collaboration between two people, one named Ida and the other Mona, otherwise known as Jan. Judging by the Zombie Slayer video, the two were a romantic couple, but sometime between these first videos and his interloper investigation, Mona died. Ida's interloper investigation leads him to F-Sky, a place where you can recreate someone from a single photo. Believing that the ghost can be trapped in the Source Engine, Ida tries to recreate Mona in the DM tool to be with her again. If the paranormal theory Ida has is true, inside this twitching grey abomination could very well be a human soul being tormented by her former partner in this liminal abyss. Now this part may be a stretch, but I can't help but notice that the name Ida Mona sounds very similar to the word eudaimonia, a term famously used by Aristotle to describe a human flourishing and finding well-being and happiness. After Mona's passing, Ida has resorted to unconventional means as a way of trying to retrieve his sense of eudaimonia. Even if the goodbye video was the last video uploaded to the Ida Mona Machinima channel, at the point of writing this, there's still one more archived video left to cover. This video was never uploaded to Ida Mona. It's exclusive to the archive. The video is another look at the weird TF2 crash video. However, things are off. Whereas in the original video, the scout entity flew through the skybox and crashed the game, something very different happens here. Only does the scout entity lunge at the camera, the spy's movements in-game don't match up either. This recording has been altered by the software it's been imported to, the DM editor. We can also see similar bits of the interface as the goodbye video, and after the program crashes, we see a brief glimpse of another tool, something called the Source Sample Tool. The purpose of the sample tool, we do not know yet, but it looks like it has something to do with the recordings of Source games, which it appears it also has the ability to change and manipulate. Going towards the description, things get even weirder. Before, the descriptions on these archived videos were a summary of the video before it was deleted, along with the original description. But here, it's a dialogue between two parties. 
I was unsure whether or not to release this video as it was personal, but decided it should go up. This was sent to me by his old video partner who gave me the full Steam message that came along with it. This is it. I'm done for good. What the fuck do you mean? What the fuck is this? I'm leaving you the last coordinate. Please check in a year or two to make sure it's gone. This is it. Goodbye. This description confirms that this archive channel wasn't created by a longtime fan trying to restore Ida's old videos, but someone Ida knew personally and trusted with information regarding the interloper case. The last interaction Ida would have before disappearing off the internet completely was giving this associate this video and a mysterious set of coordinates. And as of right now, that's all we know about Ida Mona Machinima, a joint project between two people that became one, with Ida starting an interloper investigation that turns into an obsession with bringing back a lost one through the DM editor. Ida breaks down and removes all traces of himself from the internet. However, even if Ida is long gone, during their time investigating the interloper, they uncovered a lot of important information that will help uncover the mystery. And on that note, we return to Inomi's investigation. Episode 3 is mostly a recap of the demo files in Ida Machinima, something I've already delved much more into detail on in this video. However, near the end of Episode 3, there's an important development. Back in Episode 2, Anomi's encounter with the Umbrella Man permanently broke their copy of Portal. They spawn in the checker-floored room, can only move around for a few moments, and then the game crashes. It seems like Portal would be a dead end, right? However, the standard version of Portal isn't the only one available on Steam. Released in December 2022, Portal RTX was published by NVIDIA. It's just like normal Portal, but if you don't own a NASA supercomputer, the game will boot you back to the desktop and call you poor. It's essentially just Portal with souped up graphics. However, after the Umbrella Man incident, it behaves much differently. Anomi runs Portal RTX, and surprisingly, it works. Kind of. Anomi still spawns in the empty checkered void. However, the game doesn't crash. The next lead in the interloper investigation is finding out what the purpose of this void is. Episode 4 of this series is very unique. Unlike the previous episodes of this series which were recorded, scripted, and fully edited in advance, Episode 4 was a livestream event. The stream starts with a massive discovery Anomi has made regarding the interloper, and it all ties back to the portal red room. In this room, Anomi can't use developer commands, can't interact with anything, and can't use any configs or manipulate the game in any way. By all means, this red checkered void should be a complete dead end. But there's a secret to this red room that Anomi has just discovered. Due to limitations with the source engine, it's only possible to have one source application open at a time. But while playing Half-Life 2 Deathmatch, Anomi discovered that for some reason, you can have a source game open at the same time as the corrupted portal build. This isn't the only thing weird with the Red Room either. But what piqued my interest was when I went into the server browser. Now, you don't see anything out of the ordinary here. This is all just normal. Now, where things got interesting was when I clicked on the LAN tab. And look at that. So, it's some kind of blank server. Zero players. Um, no name. So, okay. What the hell is this? I did a test a few minutes ago. You know, before anything, I closed Portal RTX, and lo and behold, the server goes away. So right away, Portal RTX is hosting a Half-Life 2 Deathmatch server? How much sense does that make? Portal RTX being open creates a joinable LAN server in the server browser. It's an empty server, and the map name is INT Menu. While this is strange by itself, joining the server results in something even stranger. After connecting to the server, Anomi loads an alternate main menu screen. The only difference being that the quit button has been replaced by a disconnect button. Clicking it brings you back to the standard main menu. However, this isn't the only quirk with this alternate main menu. And boom, look at that. Demo generation, right here. No idea how this is happening, but we're generating demos again. Looks like the map name stood for interlope menu. 
Before, Nomi could only generate demos using the interlope commands one day in November per year, due to needing an F-Sky connection in order to use the commands. However, their encounter with the Umbrella Man and subsequent corruption of Portal has created some sort of tether to F-Sky that allows the generation of demos outside November. So now with the ability to generate demos again, we get to see the process of generating demos in real time. And this peek behind the curtain is absolutely fascinating. During the demo generating process, some interesting things begin to happen. Whoa, what is this? This demo is very unique compared to the others that we've seen. It's a still shot of a room with calming yet uneasy music playing in the background. Eventually, the camera moves through a wall before suddenly ending. It's worth noting the similarities to the demo generated by Ida during their investigation. Perhaps this could be a sixth type of demo that shows the direction required to travel between maps. However, that's not all. If you were paying attention to the bottom right of the screen during the clip, you may have noticed that Portal RTX was changing. Not only does the player move with no input from a Nomi, but a string of commands appears in the chat box. At one point, you can see that a Nomi connects to an FSky server, server 27015, the same number that a Nomi inputs as a council command to generate demos. This absolutely confirms that FSky servers are what is powering the interlope commands. However, this is far from the strangest thing to occur during the stream. After a while, Anomi tests to see if Half-Life 2 Deathmatch is the only game compatible with Portal RTX. He boots up TF2 and looks in the server browser. And sure enough, there it is. After loading it up, the main menu for TF2 drastically changes. This main menu screen is a drastically overhauled version of the first main menu screen TF2 ever had. The title is gone and replaced by random characters, and most of the options are gone. But the interlope commands still function. After exploring TF2 for a bit, Anomi decides to test a game that we haven't seen yet in the series, Left 4 Dead 2. Using the developer console, Anomide is able to connect to this server, and just like TF2, the Left 4 Dead menu has completely been overhauled to resemble TF2's interlope menu. The interlope command also works for Left 4 Dead 2. However, the demos generated by the game are quite different compared to the others. We already know that some demos are more common in certain games. For instance, Type 4 demos are very common in Portal. But, there's a type of demo in Left 4 Dead specifically that's exceedingly common, and I'll just nickname it a cliffhanger demo for obvious reasons. For some reason, most of the demos generated by Left 4 Dead are simply just a character dangling on a ledge begging for help. Either their teammates are gone, or they simply just stand around doing nothing. There's a particular demo of Coach dangling off of the bridge from the parish that's particularly creepy to me. He's just dangling there begging for help as his teammates hover in the air behind him, doing nothing. It's an image that feels right out of one of those old Ben Drowned videos. After generating more of these cliffhanger demos, things pick up in intensity. Huh? Oh shit! Guys, guys. Look, look, look. We got one. Dude. Is it? No, absolutely. Wow. Out of all of the Type 5 demos we've seen in this series, this one might just be the strangest. In the demo, Ellis lays incapacitated on the ground. One of his arms is completely missing. A horde of zombies runs past him. 
Normally, the zombies would stop to beat down on the incapacitated survivor, but they keep running past him as if there's something approaching so dangerous they can't even spare the time for the survivor. And we see what the zombies are running from. A group of T-posing zombies comes into view. They slowly make their way toward Ellis before he falls through the world and eventually crashes through the skybox. These T-posing zombies are reminiscent of the heavies in the TF2 Type 5 and the T-posing scout from Ida's weird crash video. Crashers, as he would call them. You can also hear the same drowning sound effect that's been used multiple times now for dynamic NPCs as Ellis falls through the floor. Things get even stranger when paying closer attention. If you pause at the right moment when Ellis falls through the floor, you can see something behind the T-posing zombie entities. A giant severed hand. At the beginning of the demo, we see that Ellis is missing a hand, so there must be some sort of connection here, but it's not one I've been able to wrap my head around yet. And watch what happens to Portal RTX during the Type 5. It moves again with no input. The player floats away from the red room and lands in a completely new room, a much larger room with gray tiles instead of red. After the Type 5 demo ends, Anomi checks the game files for the demo, but their search yields no results. For some reason, none of the demos being generated are saved to the system anymore, and trying to reload a demo simply results in the game crashing, destroying the chances of ever retrieving the file. After the Type 5 incident in Left 4 Dead, Anomi moves on to Portal 2 for testing. Although Portal 1 is corrupted, Portal 2 is in good enough condition to test. Portal 2 also has a multiplayer mode which allows Anomi to connect to the FSky server, which leads to another interloper menu. Just like Portal 1, Portal 2 generates mostly Type 4 demos, and the gameplay in these demos gives Darkseid Phil a run for his money, with most of the demos ending with the player falling to their death. However, two demos stick out. The first is a Type 2 demo that takes place in the playable teaser for Super 8. This one, I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have any lore relevance. I just wanted to mention it because I had no idea Valve made a Super 8 teaser for Portal 2. Does anyone even remember this movie even existed? The other demo of note is a demo that starts off like any other Type 4. However, it changes when the player in-game begins to float. In Portal RTX, once more the camera moves, going from a large gray checkered room to a new gray checkered room, just as the player in Portal 2 dies. The new room in Portal RTX is very much the same as the last one. However, a long rectangular shadow stretches across the room. After this demo is where things get extremely strange. Anomi loads a new demo that starts with the player grabbing a cube before falling into a room that isn't in the game. Once more, we see the interlope command's ability to alter and create maps. And what this map has been altered into is a giant maze. The player begins to navigate the maze. Remember how it was theorized that the aimless wandering from Type 3 demos was speculated to be gameplay from one map transposed onto another? Perhaps these aimless wandering demos were for something like this. A giant maze built under another map. The tension begins to build. An uncanny piano song starts to play. At one point, the player freezes at what looks like a blue doorway, but turns to the right and continues wandering the maze. The music amps up as the player navigates the maze in the demo, until this happens. As the player explores the maze in Portal 2, the camera moves forward in Portal RTX to reveal a brightly lit doorway. This is what was casting that rectangular shadow. In Portal 2, the player falls through the floor, while the camera simultaneously begins to go through the door. Just as the camera reaches the door, it crashes while Portal 2 begins rapidly rebuilding cube maps. Among the rapidly flashing images, for one frame you can catch a glimpse of something important. The Source Sample Tool whatever it was that Ida was using during their last video before disappearing. And then, OBS crashes, and Anamide loses connection to the stream. It stays like this for a couple minutes. As Anomi tries to regain control of the stream, something bizarre happens. We catch a brief glimpse of a figure in the checkered void. It's very hard to make out, but if I had to guess, i say it looked like a very crude gray blob in a vaguely human shape. Perhaps the early form of one of those dynamic mannequin NPCs we've seen before. Eventually, Anomi regains control of the stream. He specifically mentions an incident occurring after testing Counter-Strike Source, 
However, the last time we saw Nomi was during the Portal 2 incident. It looks like someone purposely sabotaged the stream, and after that, Nomi says goodbye, ending the whole event. Later, a condensed version of the stream would be uploaded as a video, and here, Nomi elaborates on what happened. Turns out after the Portal incident, Nomi didn't even know that the stream was down. According to them, Portal 2 crashed, and Portal RTX was nothing but a white screen with music playing. Then, we learn what happened during the Counter-Strike incident. However, this isn't the only game this happened to. Every Source game now spawns Anomi in this checkered void. It seems like the investigation has hit a brick wall. There's no way to generate demos, because there's no games left to test. But we still don't know everything, and there could still be leads left to explore. This checkered void isn't the Red Room, it's much larger and grey. There could still be things left to explore in here, and judging by the stream interruption during when OBS crashed, it looks like Anomi isn't alone. Just like the liminal dark room in Gary's mod, Anomi must explore this dark void. But unlike before, we know Anomi isn't alone. Something will be searching for them, and there's no council commands to save you if you get caught. Now that we're all caught up with the series, it's time to make sense of it all. We still don't know what the purpose of the demos are, what exactly FSky servers are for, what the DM editor is, or in whatever happened at the end of episode 4. And in order to get to the bottom of this mystery, we need to go directly to the source. Pun intended. Everything in this ARG seems to revolve around something called a dynamic NPC. They're what FSky servers are built on, they're what we see in the Type 5 demos, and they're what the Umbrella Men are trying to catch. So what exactly is a dynamic NPC? From what we can learn from the videos, it looks like dynamic NPCs are produced by a scrapped source tool called the DM Editor most likely standing for Dynamic Editor. We've seen brief glimpses of this editor through Itamona Machinima, and Anomi is able to briefly access it during the Portal 1 incident. We know that the DM tool is capable of controlling Dynamic NPCs. Anomi accidentally uses it to control one of the Dynamic NPCs in Portal using a hint node, and we also see a hint node being used in the two-hour Ouija demo. However, for some reason, a third party is trying to have the existence of these Dynamic NPCs hidden from the public. The mysterious Umbrella Men are seen capturing the Dynamic NPCs, dragging them into the skybox and out of view. And in the Source games, there seem to be these mysterious Crasher entities designed to hinder people who get too close to uncovering the truth. Anomi Stream was directly sabotaged to prevent information from getting out, but who's hiding the existence of Dynamic NPCs and why? My theory is that Valve themselves are the ones trying to bury the truth. Back during the first episode, the interlope commands were snuck into the game as a note for someone named JJ by a Valve employee, going under the nose of their superiors. And Valve themselves are the ones with the influence and manpower to program these Umbrella Men and Crashers to stop people from uncovering the truth. But why? Why would Valve go through all of this effort to stop people from finding what it basically amounts to cut content? Because there's more to these NPCs that meets the eye. In their investigation, Ida believed that the dynamic NPCs were actually ghosts, attempting to communicate with them via a Ouija board map. And while for the most part they received no answers, on the final night, a ragdoll is seen twitching, trying to answer yes. The NPCs in these Type 5 demos also certainly act human, responding to stimuli and appearing to express genuine fear and panic. So while these NPCs may not be literal ghosts, they're certainly aware. I believe these dynamic NPCs were a result of Valve experimenting with AI, and accidentally creating a tool that allows the creation of fully sentient AI. The dynamic NPCs are living puppets trapped within the confines of a game engine. Not only was this sentient AI capable of existing in the game world, it was also capable of playing the game itself. This is what we see during the generated demos. These demos are generated gameplay of dynamic NPCs learning to play the game. This also explains why there would be so many Type 4 demos in Portal of the AI just trying to solve puzzles. It's the perfect game for an AI to learn how to interact with the environment. Over time, other people also began to use the DM editor for Dynamic NPCs too. Fsky, a Norwegian server hosting forum, began to use the Dynamic NPCs as part of their servers, advertising fun games and the future of games entertainment. 
They even began to make advancements with the tool too, creating a rudimentary tool that could replicate someone in the DM editor using only a picture of their face. However, something's not entirely right with these dynamic NPCs. We can see this in the F-Sky ad when one of the dynamic NPCs begins to stumble and twitch, or the dynamic NPC Ida creates and calls Mona, a legless twitching body in a dark void. People start to become angry at F-Sky. You can see this in the notes left in the demo maps. Chicken shit administrators come and get me. Fuck you! Ida's goodbye video could also be directed towards F-Sky. I've had enough of this shit. Hope you're all happy. Now leave me alone. Possibly due to reasons related to F-Sky, Valve scraps the DM editor and tries to hide its existence. They introduce Umbrella Men NPCs whose goal is to find dynamic NPCs and capture them. They program crashers to crash the games of anyone who tries to dive deeper. And if someone gets too far, they will break an entire game to stop them. And if someone keeps going, they might even break every source application, forcing people to be stuck in an infinite void in every source game. Looking through the main five types of demos, you can see the evolution of a dynamic NPC. In type 1 demos, the most common, the AI just twitches and spins the camera around. They've just been spawned in, and are in their very early stages of development. In type 3 demos, NPCs are seen aimlessly walking around and interacting with things at random. Now the dynamic NPC has gained some very basic sense of movement and interaction, however, they lack direction, and so they just aimlessly wander about. In Type 4 demos, the dynamic NPCs can be seen properly playing the game, finally having gotten a grasp of the reality in the game they inhabit. Which leads us to Type 5 demos, where the AI has become so advanced it has become sentient, which gains the attention of the Umbrella Men, who capture the dynamic NPC and trap them in the skybox. And finally, the Type 2 demos, where an NPC is seen blankly staring out from the skybox, where they then die, ending the life cycle of a dynamic NPC. So where is the future of the series headed? We know about the dynamic NPCs in the DM editor, and after what happened to Onomi's copies of Source games, it looks like we're running out of leads. Well, there's some important things to discover. The first big lead is finding out whatever the Source sample tool is. We see Ida using it during their final video, and whatever it is, is connected to the DM editor. We don't know much about the tool now, but it looks like it has the ability to sample gameplay clips and manipulate them, like a beefed up version of the standard demo editor. This tool looks like the most likely direction that Part 5 could take. What is also shaping up to be an important plot point is the coordinates Ida gave in their final video. These coordinates don't go anywhere in the real world, and no one's found anything so far. So if the coordinates look like something you could solve, you might just lead us to the next big stepping stone in the series. And this next theory may be a bit of a stretch, but I could also see Dota 2 becoming an important plot point in the future. All of Anomi's Source games now force them into the checkered void, presumably even Dota 2. However, Dota 2 is unique in the fact that it has a top-down camera angle. Perhaps Dota 2 could be the key to exploring this seemingly infinite void. One last seemingly important detail is that there's another video with links to the Interloper series. It's called Source Filmmaker 10th Year Anniversary Intro, and it's a fan-made intro for Source Filmmaker. But near the end of the video, this happens. This short snippet at the end has appeared at the end of several Interloper episodes, and near the beginning of the video, there's a frame of a red X. This same red X appeared for a single frame in the first Interloper video. This video is obviously connected to the series, but I left it out of my analysis because the connection isn't clear yet, which can only leave me to speculate. Perhaps this video is hinting at the involvement of something we've yet to see in the series, Source Filmmaker. It's an official tool released by Valve for creating films in the Source engine, using the Source Engine. Perhaps this program could also be a lead as we approach the next episode. Because, as a last minute development, Anamide has released a teaser for Episode 5 coming August 6th. So now that we're all caught up, I can't wait to see what's in store. I wanted to talk about Interloper because I've always had a passion for internet horror. Whether that be creepypastas back in the day, or the rise of analog horror or surreal horror like Liminal Spaces. This web series perfectly encapsulates everything I love about these projects. That's why I went on my 12 minute ramble at the beginning, to try and give you the full context on what makes this series so special. I really like doing these deep dive videos, and if you guys keep supporting it the way you did Emesis Blue, I'd love to keep doing more of them. 
I normally don't ask this, but since I've recently poured all of my time into perfecting this channel, if you like what you see, consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. It goes a long way to help a budding channel like mine. And if you really want to support the channel, consider subscribing to my newly formed Patreon page. You get behind the scenes bonus content, perks on my Discord channel, and an exclusive podcast every month. You can opt out anytime, and it's all completely optional. Thank you everybody for watching the video, and stay tuned for episode 5 of Interloper. I know I'll be watching it too. Remember to visit Manco's store. I know if you don't, I live in your walls.